Welcome back to Budget and Bling, the series where we take the Commander Precon decks and upgrade them for a little or a lot. In this video, I want to talk about Planner Portal, a new Rakdos Precon Commander deck from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, and the budget and bling upgrades that I would make to this deck, and the video starts right now. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters who power our channel. Check out our Patreon for monthly giveaways, exclusive content, and even a starring role in our fanfight series. Link in the description below. Hello and welcome to the day. Thank you for spending your time with us. Welcome back to another episode of Jake and Joel or Magic. I am Joel. Today we're going to talk about Planner Portal and the upgrades that I would make spending a little bit of money and a lot of bit of money. Remember to stick around until the end of the video and I'll tell you exactly what I would cut from this deck to make room for some of the upgrades that we're going to make. And as always, comment below what you think the most expensive card is going to be that I suggest you should put into planner portal let's take a look at the commander of this deck prosper tome bound is a red a black and two other for a 1-4 tiefling warlock with death touch prosper has mystic arcanum at the beginning of your end step exile the top card of your library and until the end of your next turn you may play that card and Pact Boon. Whenever you play a card from exile, create a treasure token. So we've got some impulse draw going here. We've seen this get more and more support in red over the last three to four years. And Prosper is a great commander representing that ability. It's great that Prosper gives us an extra card in our hand every turn, essentially, giving us a little bit of velocity, but it's even cooler that when we cast a spell from exile, we ramp via a treasure token. In black and red, that can't be understated. So we've got some impulse draw built in, we've got some treasure built in, we've got some ability to cast cards from exile and ramp. So we should look at adventures, we should look at foretell, pull some of the best cards from there and put them into this pre-constructed deck. Taking a look at our budget upgrades, I want to start with some good foretell cards. I went through all of the cards that have foretell and have adventure as possibilities for this deck because they say, you can see in the reminder text down there, during your turn you can pay two and exile this card from your hand, cast it on a later turn for its foretell cost. So that is casting a spell from exile. Dual Strike is a red and a red for an instant. Whenever you cast your next instant or sorcery spell with CMC 4 or less this turn, copy that spell, you can choose new targets for the copy, and it foretells for one red. So if on an earlier turn you go ahead and foretell this for two, it exiles, and at instant speed on a later turn, you can cast Dual Strike for one red mana. There are a lot of instants and sorceries that come in this box right ready to go, and so I think Dual Strike is actually a very viable card in this deck. You can get a foil of this card for a dollar it's a budget inclusion go grab it this is another one that i think is a great foretell card that can give us some synergy with prosper poison the cup two black one other for destroy target creature at instant speed then if it was foretold which is what we want to do you also scry two so you foretell this on an earlier turn you then cast it for one black one other from exile if prosper's on the battlefield you create a treasure token you scry two we're destroying a creature we're getting a lot of value for our mana I think Poison the Cup is great. It's another uncommon, so you can get a foil of it for a dollar. Go and check it out. Atali Primal Storm. Everybody knows this card. It's just a big, silly creature that definitely fits the synergies of this deck, but wasn't included. It's included in a lot of pre-constructed decks, though, so I understand why they left it out of this one. But for a budget inclusion at only a dollar, I would go and get this dinosaur. When it attacks, you exile the top card of each player's library. Then you can cast any number of spells from among those cards without paying their mana costs. See if you can give Atali haste. Cast Atali, attack with Atali two three four depending on how many opponents are left cards off the tops of libraries every time you cast one of them for free you're then also getting a treasure token of prospers on the battlefield the synergies are ridiculous and i really like the dinosaur in this deck now if we don't have some great spells that have foretell let's just have every spell have foretell and we can run dream devourer it's only two dollars it's a black and one other for a zero three demon cleric and this is really the only text we care about each non-land card in your hand without foretell has foretell. Its foretell cost is equal to its mana cost reduced by two. So if we foretold our commander, for instance, just as an example over there, we would foretell it for two on an earlier turn, and then we would be able to cast it as a creature for a black and a red at a later turn. Obviously our commander comes out of the command zone. I'm not saying that you would ever do that. I just wanted to use a very easily seen example for what Dream Devourer does for your deck. Does that 
spell cost a black, a red, and four other? Well, for tell it for two with Dream Devour, and then later you can cast it for four instead of six. It's just a way of sort of investing in a spell for later use and prosper, being able to create treasure tokens if you're casting cards out of exile. I think Dream Devourer is an absolute all-star in this deck. Again, for only two bucks. Rise of the Dreadmarn is another foretell cost that I think is super viable. It creates X22 black zombie berserker creature tokens where X is the number of non-token creatures that died this turn. And it foretells for one black at instant speed. So it takes that two, lets you pay it earlier, goes into exile, and then you cast it later at instant speed when there's been a huge board wipe. It's not just counting creatures off of your side of the battlefield that died. It's counting all creatures. As long as they're non-tokens, you're getting a ton of 2-2s. Two I love Rise of the Dreadmarn in this deck. Only two bucks. Murderous Rider. This represents the first of the adventure cards that I thought was great for this deck because you cast it as a removal spell. Destroy target creature or planeswalker and lose two life. The adventure over there. Two black, one other. And then it exiles. And then you can cast it later as a creature. A 2-3 creature for three with lifelink. Not the most impressive thing in the world, but the fact that it's a removal spell that then comes back as a creature and also has synergy with Prosper. Totally worth the $2 inclusion in this. As does Bone Crusher Giant. The adventure side of it, damage can't be prevented this turn and it deals two damage to any target. That top text, damage can't be prevented this turn, you'll be surprised how often that can be a tricky little thing that'll stumble your opponents. The shock is fine, but the damage can't be prevented this turn, that could be huge. And that's instant speed. Then, just like our removal spell, it goes off into the nether, becomes a bone crusher giant when you want to recast it, triggers a treasure token off of Prosper when you cast it if Prosper's on the battlefield. Totally love bone crusher giant. $3, go and pick it up. So we've talked about impulse draw. Let's look at one of the best budget options for impulse draw, and that's Bergy God of Storytelling. Now we'll look at the front side of it. Three mana for a three, three. Whenever you cast a spell, add a red mana and until end of turn, you don't lose mana as steps and phases end. Then creatures you control can boast twice during each of your turns rather than once. We don't care so much about that. We don't really care about any of that front ability because we want to be playing Harnfell Horn of Bounty. This is a five mana legendary artifact that says discard a card, exile the top two cards of your library. You may play those cards this turn. Late in the game, this card is one of the most powerful ones you can be running in this deck, and it's only $5 to pick it up. The front of the card is fine. It's just not what we need in this deck. The back of the card, Harnfell, Horn of Bounty, that's what we need in this deck. This card is a boss. Late in the game, throwing a land into the graveyard that we don't care about to exile the top two and just increase our hand size by two, that's fantastic. It's kind of card draw. It's velocity. Plus, they're coming from exile if they get cast and Prosper's creating treasure tokens, which is all we want to be doing, is creating treasure tokens so that eventually... We can revel in riches. Here's a ridiculous win con for this deck. Whenever a creature and opponent controls dies, create a colorless treasure artifact token. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control 10 or more treasures, you win the game. This is a five mana enchantment that says win the game on it. The synergy with the commander is fantastic. It's only $7. Put some other treasure token creators in this deck and you are just going to be reveling in all of the riches. Speaking of reveling in riches, let's talk about the bling upgrades that I would make. And the first card I would put in here for $11 is Stolen Strategy, a red and four other for an enchantment that says at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of each opponent's library until end of turn, you may cast non-land cards from among those exiled cards and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. Very good. Need to answer this if you're the opponents on the battlefield. The synergy with the commander. I love this enchantment in this deck. It definitely needs to be an inclusion. Now for $12, we can get Jessica's Will. It's a three mana sorcery and you choose one. And if you control your commander, you can choose both. So you can either add a red for each card in target opponent's hand or exile the top three cards of your library and you can play them this turn or do both if you've got your commander on the battlefield. The idea here is to offset the cost, at least offset the cost of Jessica's will by targeting an opponent with at least three cards in hand, but hopefully you're gonna get more than that out of a maximum of three opponents. And then that impulse draw on top, being able to play those cards this turn, Jessica's will, $12, it's an auto include for me in this deck. I just definitely want it in there. 
Valky God of Lies is a planeswalker slash creature we could run. The front side is Valky, and it's a two mana, two one. When it ETBs, each opponent reveals their hand for each opponent. They exile a creature card. They revealed this way until Valky leaves the battlefield. So that's pretty nice. We can absolutely just go in there, yoink a creature out of each opponent's hand. I love cards that say each opponent. And then that bottom ability X, choose a creature card exiled with Valky with converted mana cost X. Valky becomes a copy of that card. That is nothing to shake a stick at. This could pull a really good creature out of your opponent's hands, especially with the option of all three opponents and all of their hands. Pull those creature cards out, have Valky turn into them. That could be cool in a pinch. But the other side of this card is Tybalt Cosmic Imposter. And it's a seven mana, five loyalty planeswalker with a passive ability that says as Tybalt enters the battlefield, you get an emblem with you may play cards exiled with Tybalt and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. Tybalt's plus two ability exiles the top card of each player's library. We can cast those because Tybalt has given us that emblem that says you may play cards exiled with it and you can spend mana as though it were mana of any color. That minus three exile an artifact or creature. We'll take that one specifically, please. If we didn't want a plus two and just get three, three brand new options. That ultimate exiling all cards from all graveyards, adding three probably would never trigger that just because the synergy with Prosper and Tybalt exiling cards from their library. We can cast those exiling artifacts or creatures right off the battlefield and we can play those triggering prosper creating treasure tokens. This is fantastic. $14 for this planeswalker right now in its cheapest version i love it in this deck and i also love treasure i've got some newer cards in here it's kind of interesting the synergies that we've seen across sets that have come out in the same year gold span dragon is a five mana four four with flying in haste when it attacks or becomes the target of a spell create a treasure and the absolute cherry on top of this card treasures you control have tap sack add two mana of any one color it's ridiculous it makes your treasure tap for double. It's a $21 mythic dragon. It's still in standard at time of shooting this video. So that's, it's widely played there. And that's why it's kind of pricey right now, but it's also good in EDH and it's great in this deck. If you can get a gold span dragon, grab one. Oh my goodness. I put land in this upgrade. I don't normally go with lands, but look y'all, these pre-con decks have gotten so good and so focused that it's harder to go in and make cuts. There's not a ton of obvious ones. Obviously, I've got a big list of them right after we're done with these bling upgrades, but I would say let's start looking at the land base. Let's spend a little money. $23 for luxury suite. Enters the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents. Okay. It's just a dual landing commander. Dope. $23. Go get yourself a copy of this land. Deflecting swats a three mana instant. If you control a commander, you can cast it for free. And it says you can choose new targets for target spell or ability. This exists to protect your commander for free. It is a $30 card, so it's not a free card, but it can be a free spell in your deck. Protect this commander. A lot of the synergies of this deck and a lot of value added from Prosper is only going to work if he's on the battlefield. So we need Prosper on the battlefield. Consider cards that give Prosper indestructible. Consider cards like Deflecting Swat that are going to protect your commander. I think that this deck will run very efficiently without the commander, without the cast, but the value there is just absolutely ridiculous. So you know your opponents are going to be trying to remove it. Deflecting Swat for 30 bucks. I love that as an inclusion in this deck. Another land, Bloodstained Mire. Let's get a little fetch action going up in here. If we can't find a card to cut, let's cut a basic and put a fetch land in there. That's what I'm talking about. Bloodstained Myers 42. Tap it, pay a life, go get a swamp or a mountain card. And those can be non-basic lands as long as they have the subtype swamp or mountain. I love Bloodstained Mire in here. 42 bucks, go get yourself a copy. Look, look, look. We can't talk about a treasure deck without putting Dockside Extortionist in it. It's $52 now. It had a big jump after it was not reprinted in Modern Horizons 2 like many people thought it would be. But it's just the best at what it does. Two mana for a 1-2 creates X treasures where X is the number of artifacts and enchantments your opponents control. Absolutely ridiculous. $52. This card is so strong. If you've never played this card, it's so strong. If you've played it, you know it's so strong get dockside extortionist <laughs> all right we've come to the most expensive card that i'm going to suggest in this video so you better have commented down below if you want to be right about this think about this treasure tokens 
quick ramp. What do we want to do? We want to run Monkey. Ragavan, Nimble Pilfer. One mana for a 2-1 Monkey Pirate. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token and exile the top card of that player's library until end of turn. You can cast that card. It also dashes for two mana, so it goes out, pops them for a treasure, exiles the top card. You can play that if you want. And then Ragavan goes scurrying right back into your hand. It's crazy when such an expensive card is a one toughness creature and it is so synergistic with the rest of your deck. As far as cuts go, like I said, this deck is ridiculously solid right out of the box, but one of the sub themes that I don't really buy into for this commander is creature tokens. I think it's hinting that aristocrats could be good, sacrificing creature tokens for more value, something like that. But I just don't buy it as far as Prosper's abilities. I want to focus on those. So I would say that's a really good place to start. Marionette Master represents one of those. It fabricates three when it comes into the battlefield. So you create three one ones or put three plus one plus one counters on Marionette Master. And then whenever an artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to Marionette Master. This seems like one that was included because of how many mana rocks are included in this deck. But then they were like, okay, well, let's go with the creature token thing. Maybe we can give Marionette Master some more to do besides just being like an outlet for artifact value when some of our mana rocks go down the drain. Ogre Slumlord's a 5-mana 3-3 three, three Ogre Rogue. Whenever another non-token creature dies, you can create a 1-1 one, one rat creature token. And rats you control have Death Touch. Just more really good support for a creature token deck. You'll actually see a couple more rats cards. I think that rats creature tokens was sort of a sub theme they were going for and Ogre Slumlord represents that. But I just think it's a cut because we're not going to play that strategy. Piper of the Swarm, yet again. Rats you control have Menace. Two mana tap it, create a 1-1 one, one rat. Four mana tap it, sack three rats, gain control of target creature. Really ridiculous, really strong, doesn't really fit in this deck for what we're going to try and do. Notice that you don't have to make these same cuts. You can use some of the upgrades that I suggested and really even lean more into the creature token thing if you wanted to. Chittering Witch represents some of the same kind of value. It enters a battlefield, you create a number of 1-1 black rat creature tokens equal to the number of opponents you have, and pay two, sack a creature, target creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. That bottom ability, I think, is what they're trying to show a newer player who has this deck. Hey, you could do this with this deck, which I think is cool. It's a really good way to take these pre-constructed decks, make them strong out of the box, and put maybe a sub-theme in there that's like, hey, you could take it in this direction. Maybe a couple of sub-themes. Hey, you could go in either direction here if you want to focus your deck up. What we're doing to focus our deck up is cutting out the token strategy, obviously, but you can sort of see what they were going for. Pontiff of Blight. Now, this is a good overall creature. I just don't personally like it, but it would be really strong in a token deck because other creatures you control have Extort. Extort is whenever you cast a spell, this thing triggers. You can pay either a white or a black, and if you do, each opponent loses one life and you gain that much life. So if you've got more creatures and you've got more mana to pay into it, you can really be draining each opponent all at the same time, which is really cool, but just not the way that we're taking this deck. Dream Pillager, I just don't like this card at all. It's too expensive for its power and toughness. Five, six, seven mana for a four, four flyer. Whenever it deals combat damage, so it's not an attack, it's gotta get through as a four, four with no other avoidance besides flying. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, exile that many cards from the top of your library until in the turn you can cast non-land cards exiled this way. So you see what it was trying to fit as far as its role in this deck, what it was trying to do. I just don't think it's a really good representation of this ability. There's a lot better ways to do what Dream Pillager is trying to do. Loyal Apprentice is a hasty two mana, two one. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control your commander, you create a one one flyer and the token gains haste. It's another token creator. It's good if you're going tokens. It's not really what we want to be doing in this deck. Hex, I hate this card. I just straight up hate this card. I've been burned by it so many times. I remember the first time I saw this card, I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Oh my gosh, destroy six target creatures for six mana. It is at sorcery speed, so it's a little slow, and there do have to be six targets. If you need to kill one crucial commander, and there's no other creatures on the battlefield, Hex is a dead card in your hand. I hate cards that can be super dead in your hand, and Hex can be super dead in your hand. I would be cutting this one out immediately as soon as I got the deck. An Apex of Power, it's a 10 mana sorcery. Exile the top seven until end of turn. You can cast spells from among them, and if it was cast from your hand, add 10 mana of any one color. 
this is sort of like the ultimate spell that Prosper Tomebound would cast. However, for me as a commander player and not like leaning into the lore or the feel of this deck, the flavor, if you will, I just don't like this as a 10 mana spell. I just don't like it. It's just not for me. I would say you can cut Apex of Power so that you're not trying to cast 10 mana spells. Instead, you're playing, you know, some four and five and six mana spells that are much more value centric and easier to cast. That's how I would upgrade Planner Portal. Let me know down in the comments the way you are taking this deck because I want to talk to you about it. Other than that, hit that subscribe button on your way out if you like the video. It really helps us out so much. And I'm tapped out. I'll catch you later.